in fact, most economic decisions are deeply political and they reflect relative power and they have very different implications for different segments in society. I would argue mainstream economics doesn't do a good job in explaining consumption, investment, employment, resource allocation, and so on. So that's the first, but definitely it does a, a terrible job in all of the things that it sees as outliers or external to the system. We can organize our economies differently, recognizing and rewarding and respecting care work much more, um, recognizing that innovation is a human urge and it doesn't always require you know, material profit. We have immense existing inequalities that are bound to create even more social and political tensions that create very, very unstable societies. This is not a recipe for a future. So clearly we have to do something and it's urgent. It's no longer something that we have to do eventually because climate change will happen or these other things will happen. These are happening. And unless that sense of urgency permeates within my own country, but across the world, we are not heading for just you know bad news ahead. We are heading for complete disaster and possibly the end of the species. Economics is fundamental to everyone's lives. It matters hugely. And I think one of the big problems in the world has been that economics has been treated as this very technical thing which is out of the reach of ordinary people. And that's terrible because the impact of economic processes and economic policies is so significant on everyone's lives that it's too important to be left to economists. Unfortunately, what has happened is that economists, the mainstream discipline has tried to create this, uh, you know, very sort of technical superstructure which scares people off. And then they're told that there are these iron laws that operate and nobody else can understand them. And so whatever happens has to happen. This is the, there's no alternative to this. You have to accept it. That's very wrong because in fact, most economic decisions are deeply political and they reflect relative power and they have very different implications for different segments in society. So economics matters hugely. And it's very unfortunate that most ordinary citizens are not given that basic grounding which will allow them to call the bluff when necessary. One of the reasons why economics is so important is precisely this, is that it affects so many people's lives directly and indirectly through economic policies. And it is one of the important areas in which economics is presented as a science, when it's not, it's a social science, which means it's inherently subjective. It, uh, all of the economic models have with them significant assumptions, many of which are often unrealistic. And yet the results of those models are then used to justify particular policies, which are imposed on economy. So there's a very substantial difference between the, the study of economics and the ways in which economic engineering, as you describe it, the policies that are then presented to people are done. Let me just give you one example. So much of the developing world's trade and industrial policies are driven by what are called the principles of comparative advantage. And these are taken as, you know, taken for granted that this is part of the the iconic you know, knowledge within economics, and it's obviously true and has to be implemented, which means countries must invest in the areas in which they have comparative advantage. This ignores the fact that most of the, I mean, that the theory of comparative advantage, including the Heckscher-Rollin factor endowment theory, as it's called, is based on a set of very, very simplifying and wrong assumptions, wrong in the sense that they're not relevant to the modern world. For example, perfect competition. For example, constant returns to scale, which means there are no scale economies. Now, once you do that and you say you have to invest in the areas in which you have your comparative advantage today, you are condemning countries to stay at that low level of development, not to get into areas with increasing returns to scale, with uh, 
they also assume full employment, which we know doesn't exist in the world today. The minute you drop both those assumptions, the results of those models collapse. Yet policymakers use those models in situations where they're completely not valid. The countries that have been successful, when you think about it in trade terms, are the countries that have ignored that advice coming from those economic models. Japan, Korea, China today, they all ignored that advice. And it's only when you actually recognize that the model is based on these assumptions, let's check whether those assumptions hold for our reality, and let's then think of other arguments that may hold better for our reality. It's only then that you can actually do economic engineering that is beneficial for the greater majority of the people. is a very different role that economics can play for the common good compared to what it does. But here, I think it's also important to recognize that what we have today, mainstream economics, is only one tradition of economics, that there has been a very long and rich alternative tradition, which is typically ignored, which is not taught in most schools, colleges, and universities, which is not promoted in research, which is not allowed into institutions, research institutions and policy making. I'm referring to a tradition, well, certainly there is a long tradition if you look at the Asian traditions and so on, but even in Europe, think of you know Giovanni Botero, Antonio Serra, people who talked about increasing returns from the very beginning, who recognized why some cities in Italy did better than others, why Northern Europe does better than Southern Europe. These are obvious questions in development. And when you think about those, when you bring in economies of scale, synergies, innovation, what enables innovation in certain periods, then you recognize that a lot of these things can actually have a very important bearing today in developing countries. So it matters for people how we understand how economic processes have played out. It's very, very important for everyone to know this. And it's important to use those insights. Those are not the insights that we are given from mainstream economics today. We are given a very static, I would say moribund approach, which does not enable us to recognize the dynamisms and to take the advantage of those dynamisms, which does not emphasize the inequalities that certain processes bring about and how you could rectify those or remedy those. So I would argue that economics can still play a huge role, a positive role. Currently, I do not believe mainstream economics does. It seeks to justify a status quo, and it seeks to perpetuate the power of capital over labor very, very broadly. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. Whereas there is a long and rich tradition of much more pluralist economics, which does provide us important insights that could benefit the common good. I would argue that mainstream economics doesn't even good, do a good job of explaining consumption, you know, resource allocation, etc. The things that it claims it does very well. I don't think it does that. I don't think that many of the notions that we use as a matter of course in our discussions are actually good concepts. For example, productivity, which is output per worker, but then output GDP, how do we define it? Does it actually measure human welfare? workers? Do we include all the unpaid workers? We are not even clear about the basic concepts that we use. So I would argue mainstream economics doesn't do a good job in explaining consumption, investment, employment, resource allocation, and so on. So that's the first, but definitely it does a, a terrible job in all of the things that it sees as outliers or external to the system. The notion that, uh, you know, uh, that nature is external to the system, when it, the economy is all about human beings interacting with nature. And to treat that as an externality, to treat pollution as an externality, something outside the system, to treat um, uh, you know, the impact on, uh, on cl the climate as an externality, this is so fundamentally conceptually mistaken that it tells us there's something wrong with the way we're practicing the discipline. If we say we have this model, reality is like outside of it, that's reality's problem. There's something wrong there. We have to change that model to encompass reality. We have to change our analytical approach 
to recognize that human interaction with nature is a fundamental way in which the economy works. And to actually deal with that, we have to have theories that recognize that human interaction with the economy does the following things. We have to have assessments of output and GDP, which deal with the uh, recognition that the way we produce our output and the way we distribute it and consume it affects nature and affects our ability to consume that output or produce that output in the next period. So I would argue that it's not that economics has done a good job in this and a bad job in that. Mainstream economics has not done a good job in any of these things. There are alternative streams of thinking about these issues, which we should draw on when we are developing an economics that is relevant for the 21st century. And I think it can be done. I think it's absolutely necessary for economists to be held accountable for their advice. And I think it's a real tragedy that economists, many economists get away with murder in that sense. And sometimes it's actual murder when, you're, when you have uh, stabilization and adjustment policies that cut down on health systems, that cut down on people's ability to access their basic needs like food and so on. And there are actually people dying because of that. To me, yes, that's indirect murder. I, I had once proposed that, you know, economists will go and advise uh, governments to do, I don't know, shock therapy, uh, big bang reform, this and that. Their incomes should be cut commensurate with the decline in wages of the country that they have been, the wage incomes of the country that they have been advising, just to give them a, a sense of what is involved. Economists who go blithely into an e a economy and say, do financial liberalization, do this, do that, and then that country is exposed to major swings, has a financial crisis. How is it that nothing happens to the economists who propose this and advise this? The lack of accountability is widespread. It's not only economists, it's credit rating agencies, it's all of the people who give policy advice in the global institutions, it's all the people, including financial institutions, who lobby to force down particular policies. But none of them has accountability. And I think that that's really wrong. It's not just morally wrong, it's um, functionally stupid because it means that there's no incentive for them not to keep doing that more and more. <laughs> Let's begin with the, the definition first. To me, capitalism is a system in which production for profit dominates the organization of the economy. Does economics explain capitalism? Yes, I think there are economists, political economists, that have explained capitalism very well and continue to explain it very well. Uh, does mainstream economics explain capitalism? Well, no, because it takes it for granted as the obvious architecture. It's like it's, mainstream economics is within that gilded cage, uh, and it's gilded for the economists of, of capitalism, in which it's taking all of those assumptions as laws written in stone, that production must inevitably be for profit, that individuals operate only in terms of increasing their material self-interest, and so on and so forth. All of the assumptions of method methodological individualism, the assumptions of the profit motive determining all activity, and that you will require always a material incentive to do anything, I think these are extremely limiting for mainstream economics. And they're one of the reasons why mainstream economics is not so good at explaining capitalism. Whereas a larger branch and many economic theorists have been very good at explaining capitalism and explaining why that system creates certain results. To give you another example, uh, intellectual property, right? It's a relatively new concept. In fact, I find it hard to explain to my students who think that this is just one of those things that has always been there. The idea that you can have private property rights in intellectual property, that it can be something commodifiable, commercial, commercially used and held on to, is a relatively new idea. Human invention, human innovation, and human research predate that by many, many centuries. 
Uh, today, there is this notion that we are getting vaccines for a COVID-19 virus because we gave intellectual property to these companies. That's nonsense. We've had vaccines developed way back, right, for smallpox, to give you one small example, when people were not rewarded materially for developing that. We have had a huge range of human invention that preceded all these notions of assigning property rights, commercial property rights to invention and innovation. Today's scientific inventions are building on huge, not just centuries of human knowledge, but on public research, which is not done with a profit motive. And yet there is this notion that, well, you know, this is the only way things work. And that's wrong. And it is not just destroying and creating unequal and giving wrong incentives and so on, but it's actually foolish for humanity to confine itself into such a limiting uh, framework to organize economic life. It, the way economics and, and capitalism is structured, it also ignores or treats as externalities or as things you can ignore altogether, essential aspects, not just nature, but the care economy, for example, which operates fundamentally on altruism. It works because, well, of course you have created gender division of labor whereby women do this and so on, but the care economy works because people care for the people whom they care about. And therefore you can pass on a lot of the costs of care. You can have un unpaid care, you can have underpaid care. And all these capitalist market-oriented, profit-oriented economies benefit from that. Again, it's a very limiting way of organizing humanity, of organizing our economic life. And we're stuck in it because we accept those you know, those, those uh, boundaries set by capitalism. But we don't have to, if we can think outside that box. And it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, have this big glorious socialist revolution and everything transforms, but we can start by querying some of those very, very obvious assumptions and say, we can actually organize our societies differently. We can organize our economies differently, recognizing and rewarding and respecting care work much more, um, recognizing that innovation is a human urge and it doesn't always require you know, material profit. You don't have to keep giving huge money to corporations for doing something that humanity will tend to do anyway. There are many, many ways, I could give you many more examples, but there are many ways in which the idea that you know, capitalism is our essential economic framework is so wrong and misleading. And it doesn't have to only be posited to the complete utopia of socialism. It can be posited in many, many different ways in which you create a more porous boundary between capitalism and other economic systems. There is a very interesting book by Wolfgang Streck, the political German political false philosopher, who argues that capitalism is already dead. It's just that there's nobody around to lift the death body out of the way. <laughs> that basically, what is capitalism all about? It's about dynamism, right? It's about so-called productivity increases. It's, it's about expanding the frontiers of production. That's why we're supposed to like it. Now it turns out it's no good at doing these things. Right? It's actually a moribund system. And the reason Strick argues it's moribund is because it's been too successful for its own good. It's vanquished all the things that could regulate or control it. It's vanquished the working class and as associations of unions or anything that could confront it. It's vanquished states who could regulate its activities. It's vanquished you know, all other possibilities of alternative systems. It's now so powerful, it's the predator-prey relationship that the predator has eaten too much of the prey and is therefore going hungry. So it's a stagnant, moribund, he argues, already dead system. Now, the unfortunate part of capitalism already being dead is precisely that, that there isn't this other system waiting in the wings to come in and take over. Instead, we have this big shroud covering all of us, which can give you, let's face it, a period of really terrible times. It, Feudalism, when it was dying, it took centuries, right? And it was terrible. You had warfare, you had warlords, you had instability, you had uh, 
you know, periodic uh, class war of, of terrible proportions. You had the plague and black death. You had all kinds of bad stuff happening in that period of feudalism's decline. Similarly with capitalism, it can be a really bad period. It's, I would argue, yes, in a way it is dead in terms of its, you know, its uh, dynamic potential. Nonetheless, it can continue to be around and do a lot of damage unless we recognize this and do something about it. And it's human agency that can do it. It was a system created by human beings. It is a system that can be undone by human beings. But that human agency then has, you have to have the required social and political mobilization. You have to require, you have to have that required knowledge among enough people to force that human agency to change the system. You know, um, I think I've been fairly clear that I don't think capitalism is the best system for humanity. But I want to emphasize that it's not just not the best system. It's also the worst system from the point of view of the survival of the species. I don't want to sound overdramatic, but I think that's absolutely true. I think that a fundamentally profit-oriented system has many concerns unless you have adequate regulation adequate counterbalancing powers, adequate control over the more destructive aspects of the profit motive. And since we have lost many of those and we're not bringing them back very obviously, we ideally would be bringing back those controls. But since we have lost those controls, we're actually losing out on many uh, of the things that would keep us going as a species. We are destroying nature. We are uh, in ways that are going to hit us already. It's not just in the future anymore, which are already biting us. We are destroying our capacity for resilience. Just look at what one small virus can do in terms of destroying economic and social activity so comprehensively. We are destroying uh, our ability in social terms to function as cohesive societies because of the very, very deep and sharp inequalities we're creating. My own country, India, for example, the kinds of inequalities that have been so exposed during the pandemic, of course, they interact with our earlier existing systems of deep inequality of caste and gender and uh, religion and so on. But the way in which the pure profit motive has been allowed to play out today, our richest 1% has tripled its wealth during the pandemic. The majority of the people have lost livelihoods, have lost incomes, have lost wages. And many are close to starvation, if not already starving. We are talking about absolute hunger increasing dramatically and people unable, 80% unable to afford a minimum nutritious diet as according to the FAO. We are talking about major climate events that are already creating climate refugees. We are talking about pollution that has devastated our rivers, uh, which has affected our water supplies which is already impacting the soil because of the chemical use in the soil that is affecting agricultural products. We are talking about damage to livestock that is going to affect the ability of you know, people to in, even have meat uh, production uh, for protein intake and so on and so forth. So, and to that we have immense existing inequalities that are bound to create even more social and political tensions that create very, very unstable societies. This is not a recipe for a future. So clearly we have to do something and it's urgent. It's no longer something that we have to do eventually because climate change will happen or these other things will happen. These are happening. And unless that sense of urgency permeates within my own country, but across the world. We are not heading for just, you know, bad news ahead. We are heading for complete disaster and possibly the end of the species. Mm -hmm.